we can decompose this dipole moment into three different terms. And the first term here, we, uh, we call that is Rayleigh scattering. And this one has exactly the same frequency um, as our citation frequency, omega ex. But there's other two terms <coughs> in this dipole moment of this uh, couple spring moment carry different frequency components. One has component, have frequency components which is higher uh, than the excitation frequency. So this term is called anti-Stokes Raman scatterings. The other term has a frequency slightly lower than the, the excitation frequency. So um, from this couple of spring models, we can basically find out three different terms, three different components in this scattering light uh, that can be also illustrate uh, in this graph. When you give the molecule a citation, of course the, it's a excitation from light or it's a, a, the electromagnetic field. And then the molecule can be excited to higher states, either a electronic state or if the energy, excitation energy is not high enough, it will be excited to a virtual energy state and fall back to the original uh, energy state. Well, if it fall back to the exactly energy level, the, the, the exactly same energy level where it starts, uh, there will be no frequency change or no energy loss or gain. And this component is we, uh, what we have here is Rayleigh scattering, which is also the major component in this uh, light scattering. But there's a weaker term. This two terms are relatively weaker. Uh, it uh, involves energy gain or loss. For <coughs> anti-stokes, apparently you actually are gaining energies because uh, we start from this energy level and jump to this virtual state and fall back to the lower energy levels. You actually gain this much energy in the systems. <clears throat> and for the Stokes, then you're basically starting from a lower energy level and then be excited to a higher virtual energy state and fall back to a slightly higher energy levels and then you lose this much of energy. Um, in this talk, I'm, I'm going to particularly focus on this part, which is um, the scattering light uh, with slightly higher, uh, lower frequency or higher wavelengths than excitation uh, frequency. So hopefully this slide can show you very clearly what the, the absurd scattering is. Um, so why we uh, care about SIRS, um, I mean, uh, Raman scattering, let's start from Raman scattering. It's because the Raman scattering actually is a signal, it's an intrinsic signal from the molecule cells, and it's only dependent on the chemical composition and bonding conditions of the molecules. So um, ideally, if you have a way to detect the Raman scattering spectrum of any molecules, you will be able to differentiate them by looking at that. That's why the Raman scattering is also called optical fingerprint of uh, chemical biomolecules. For example, um, um, I actually, I was, uh, when I was a uh, student, I kind of involved in a project initiated by Intel, which they are aiming to do a single, you know, um, single base resolution DNA sequencing, serial sequencing by using SIRS or Raman scatterings. They're hoping to be able to detect the Raman scattering spectrum of each base, for example, ACGT. Well, if you have that high spatial resolution or sensitivity, uh, theoretically you can do that. You can actually serially read each base and, and find out what's the sequence of that genome. Um, but unfortunately, unfortunately, uh, from the the weight of those lines, we can see. The Rayleigh scattering is much stronger and the, the Raman scattering is much weaker. Uh, in fact, uh, this, uh, this graph shows the comparison, the intensity comparison between the Rayleigh scattering fluorescence and the Raman scattering. As you can see, Raman scattering is at the very, very bottom and the Rayleigh scattering is at the very top. So um, there is a basically 10 to the 16 um, times difference between uh, the intensity of Rayleigh scattering and Raman, intense, uh, Raman scattering. So you can see how weak this Raman scattering term is compared to the 
valence scattering or elastic scattering. Okay. Well, the reason why, by the way, the reason why we, uh, we can see some object, most of an uh, object, because there's a really scattering, for example, we can see the wall because the electrons in the wall, in the molecule in the wall, start to scatter. So we can see the, the, uh, this uh, re emitted lights from this molecule inside. That's why this, this light is pretty strong. But in fact, there is some Raman scattering signal coming out from this wall if you strike light on this wall. However, you cannot detect that because they're so weak compared to the elastic scattering. So if we want to still use this technique to do, like for example, DNA sequencing, single base pair resolutions, and then we have to find a way to enhance the signals to a level that we are able to detect uh, that's why it comes to a, a constant technology called surface enhanced Raman scattering that can uh, potentially improve the signal for more than 12 orders of magnitude, 10 to the 12, uh, to this level. If we can boost up the signal to this level, and then we can get an intensity comparable to fluorescence light, and then we can use current detectors or optical systems to, to, uh, to detect these very weak signals. Uh, this phenomenon is actually uh, the surface enhanced Raman scattering phenomenon was discovered um, over 30 years ago in the late 70s, 1970s, by some electrical chemists. When they started doing electrical um, chemistry experiments uh, on their electrodes, um, uh, they, they actually uh, do a uh, simultaneous Raman scattering spectroscopy detection. And they find out that some uh, red X potentials of electrodes, the electrodes getting uh, etched out, become a nano structure. At that point, they start to see this um, Raman scattering signal of the, of the surface over molecule start to enhance for many, many times. So they so, so from from then the people start to investigate what is the surface had Raman scattering. And nowadays, with the development of the new laser technology and new optics, uh, so this technique become a more and more practical that people start to use it in real day in, in <coughs> the world, not only in the lab. So for the surface hand Roma scattering, uh, it requires you have a molecule, biomolecule, or a chemical molecule uh, in direct contact, basically, in direct contact with uh, a nanostructure, metallic, uh, metallic nanostructures. And there are two, um, well, the, the current consensus think there are two mechanisms involved in surface enhanced Raman scattering. The first one is called a local electromagnetic field enhancement that, um, in, uh, in which the local electric field uh, near the surface and, and can be enhanced for many times. So your excitation light and also scattering light can be enhanced uh, for, for example, a couple of orders of magnitude or even several orders of magnitude, and then you have a total signal improved for 12 orders of magnitude. And the second, uh, second mechanism involved in this Raman enhanced uh, uh, surface and Raman scattering is called uh, chemical enhancement. And this one involves the, chem uh, the energy and electron transfer between uh, um, metal molecules and this organic molecule absorb on the surface. So by, um, uh, by involving these chemical enhanced mechanisms, you basically can change chemically or um, quantum mechanically change the, uh, the band gap or energy distribution, uh, distributions in the chemical molecules to improve the Raman scattering cross-section. So, I'm going to uh, talk about the, the electromagnetic enhancement first, but before doing that, I have to introduce a concept called plasma resonance because these two concepts is closely related to each other. The reason why we can create a, a very high low electric, uh, uh, electromagnetic field is because we can manipulate the free electrons in the metallic nano structures by light. Uh, it's well known that if you can couple light onto the surface uh, between uh, dielectric materials and the metals, and you can excite a surface propagating electron wave. This is not electromagnetic wave, but electron wave. Because metal, we know it's uh, 
if we, cons if we uh, consider the perfect conductors or a very good conductors, it has a lot of unbonded free electrons and be freely moved by the electric field. <coughs> so when you couple your electromagnetic field onto this interface, you can move those electrons along the surface and then you can excite a wave, a surface wave, a, a surface electron wave is called a surface plasma. Okay. So this is well known and you can also find out the wave vectors, propagation wave vectors of this electronic wave uh, by using the following equations. I'm not going to detail those equations. Um, and instead I'm going to move to a uh, nano structures. So this is a uh, surface that you can consider um, this wave can propagate uh, for a very long distance along the surface. However, when you have nano structures, this wave propagation is limited <coughs> by the physical boundaries of nano structures. So here uh, you actually uh, oppose a different boundary conditions to the systems that you can modify <coughs> the actual wave vectors of this surface plasma. That's why by controlling this nanostructure geometries, we can basically control this wave vector and, and we can control the resonance uh, frequency or wavelengths of this electronic waves in this metallic nanostructure. If we can control the free electrons in the metallic nanostructure to make it start resonating, and then we can accumulate those electrons to some sharp point. When that, happen, uh, when that happens, you have pretty high charge density at that local position. And then you can create a very high uh, <coughs> electric field, electromagnetic field at that particular point. Uh, those points in, in the surface field is called hot spots. So we can use either use electrostatic approximations to uh, to, to estimate what's the local electromagnetic field, or we can use uh, more advanced techniques, uh, simulation techniques like finite element modeling or uh, finite domain, uh, uh, finite difference time domain simulation techniques to find out what's the local electromagnetic field enhancement in different uh, nano structures. And here, uh, of course, if we want, if we use finite element modeling technique, um, we're dealing with harmonic waves, there's no time varying term here. We solve this harmonic wave equations and then use this uh, finite element modeling um, uh, mechanisms that we can solve those equations in different uh, meshes uh, in the whole nano structures and find out, eventually find out electromagnetic fields at, at different locations of the nano structures. And so if we can create this, for example, in this um, particular Nano structures, you can find, you can create some sharp points in this nano uh, systems. We can start to manipulate and accumulate all electrons near the sharp points and create a very high uh, a point with very high electric field. <coughs> At that particular point, you have a molecule stick to it, and the molecule can subject to very high electric field excitation. And, okay, so following that, which uh, is chemical enhancement mechanisms. So here I want to use only one slide talking about chemical enhancement. <coughs> um, so these two graphs, we put, we put them together for the comparison purpose. And as you can see, uh, this is a, uh, a quantum mechanical simulation of a uh, BPE molecules which has two bands of rings connect to each other. And, and this simulation allows to find out the HOMO and LUMO state. HOMO is the highest occupied molecular orbital. Uh, in a semiconductor field, it's called uh, the um, valence band edge. For LUMO, it's the uh, lowest unoccupied molecular or, uh, orbital. In the semiconductor field, it's called the conduction band edge. So you can find out the HOMO and LUMO states by using quantum, mechan quantum chemical simulations. We will know the band gap of this molecular systems. But if you attach these molecules to a metallic nail of crystals, you, you do a simulation again, you will find out this electronic distributions and also energy distributions in the whole system, in the hybrid system, becomes very different than the molecule itself. So this graph shows this more clearly 
that if we uh, plot the density of states in this molecule, in this uh, bare molecules, compared to the density of states for this hybrid system, you can find out that uh, you not only have uh, more density of states, but also the band gap, which is the energy gap between the homo state and lumo state, becomes uh, smaller. This means that we can bring the system more into, at the beginning here, as you can see, the, the energy gap between the homo lumo is in uh, a deep outer uh, violet uh, light range. But if you can uh, couple this into the hyper system, you can bring this back to visible light or near or even near infrared excitation system. So if you can do that, chemically we we turning a non-resonating molecule to a resonating molecule. So if we can do that, the, uh, the uh, scattering cross-section in Raman, uh, Raman scattering becomes much bigger than just bare molecules. So of course there is a, a electrons or holes transfer involved in, in, in this mechanism. There's a molecule, uh, there's electrons transfer between this molecule and the metallic metal first scope. There's also holes transfer between them. <coughs> so this is a, 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 a second mechanism for the surface hand Raman scattering. <coughs> and now, after talking about the fundamentals about service, and I'm, I'm going to move on to the application, a biosensing application. This, this is this is this is a BSBA institution. This is not a cancer institution. So I'm going to spend more time on the nano source uh, biosensing. So first example uh, is glucose sensing. Okay. We know that glucose sensing is also is always the, uh, the most common biosensing in the real world. And if you uh, watch TV, you see many commercials talking about glucose <coughs> meters, right? either uh, non-invasive or, or invasive. But here we're talking about uh, using this nano source as a technique to detect glucose concentration in uh, raw blood. Okay. And so here's a work, work from a group in uh, um, Van Dyne's group in uh, Richard Van Dyne's group in Northwestern University. In fact, uh, Professor Rich Van Dyne uh, was uh, among um, the first few to discover this search of techniques and he has been doing this for over 40 years almost. And now they are uh, start, start to moving to the real, to the uh, individual and in vivo sensor, especially uh, <coughs> local sensors. So for, uh, for doing the SIRS, you have to make a nanoscale SIRS substrate to allow that the, uh, uh, the molecule to absorb to the surface and also to enhance the low function field. And the way they did it is they actually, because um, they're chemistry, they start to uh, assemble those nanospheres into a ray and then deposit silver film on top of that to a uh, to form a substrate that called uh, silver uh, on nanostructure surface. Uh, and then they start to assemble the different sand molecules onto the surface and create a pocket for a glucose molecules. So when they do that, they can basically compare the source signals of the same molecules before uh, the glucose molecule attacking and after this uh, molecule uh, get into the pocket. That's exactly what they do. They actually, uh, see, if you look at this result, uh, they actually start to flushing, this is actually their uh, in vitro experiment result, they start to uh, flush glucose uh, solutions into this, uh, onto the surface. And then they start to control this, uh, this uh, introduction into a pulse uh, fashion. As you can see that in, on the, in, in A, that you have one surface spectrum. When you introduce a certain amount of uh, glucose, you start to, start to see new peaks. And if you calculate the differential spectrum between each other, you will find out, for example, uh, if we look at B minus A, which is uh, this spectrum uh, minus this spectrum, and you can see the difference between them. And the difference comes from this glucose molecules. 
So they, they consider this spectrum is, uh, is uh, due to the introduction of the glucose. Of course, for the control, if you do the subtraction between C and A, and there's nothing coming out, meaning that this, those peaks shown here definitely is coming from the, uh, the glucose molecule in a solution. <coughs> and the, uh, the advantage of these sensors, they can do is they actually and implant the sensors into a mouse model and to do a uh, real-time monitoring, long-term monitoring of glucose level in a living mouse. Because uh, this uh, search, search detection actually it only requires relatively simple optical systems that as long as you can focus the light onto the sensor surface and, and you find a way to collect that scattering light, get, in, get, get collecting light into the uh, spectrometer, you would do that. So the system is relatively straightforward. Uh, that's the reason why they can do a long-term monitoring of glucose level in a living mouse. Of course, they're starting moving uh, to a clinical trials. Now they're starting to implant those sensors into the human bodies and try to do a long-term uh, glucose level monitoring. Um, this is one application. And the second application I want, to, I want to show that is a application that's done from a, a group in Georgia Tech, from shooting these group in Georgia Tech. And they're being using this uh, golden nano particle as a surface substrate, nano surface substrate for a long time. And in recent years, they started using this uh, substrate to, to start uh, to target tumors in uh, living animals. So the way they do it actually, they coat this particle go particle surface with a, a, uh, some cross-linking molecules and also uh, antibodies that can recognize the uh, uh, epithelial growth factor receptors on the uh, surface of the uh, cancer cells. So if you have a cancer cell expressing a lot of this uh, EG uh, 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 epithelial growth factor receptors on the surface, then a, then a particle the, the modified particle can be uh, conjugated on the cell surface. And if you have enough molecules start to accumulate uh, around the cell surface, then you will detect the, uh, this molecule run the signals uh, around the cancer cells. That's, that's exactly what they did. They, they actually um, inject these particles into a living mouse and start to observe this uh, source signals from different locations in this mouse. Okay. <clears throat> so in their in, in their in vivo experiments, they actually inject these particles uh, uh, through the vein injection, IV injection into this mouse. So uh, through the blood circulation system, these particles get everywhere uh, in the body of this uh, mouse. And because it's targeting maximum, because the particle carries a lot of uh, antibodies on the surface, so eventually this particle will bind to a tumor cell surfaces and start to accumulate. So if you start to accumulate there, and you start to see if you uh, use a infrared laser as an excitation source, then you can start to observe the source signals coming out from this particle aggregation. Um, because it's a targeting mechanism, so most of the particle will stay uh, in the tumor, but not in the labors. Okay. So they also compare the Raman or SIR signals from the labors, uh, showing that compared to this tumor signals, the labor signals are very weak, meaning that there are not many particles uh, end up in the uh, labors, because the particle has those uh, recognition mechanisms to uh, to catch uh, on the surface of the, of the cancer cells. Uh, in a control experiment, they actually taking off the, those coatings on the particles, just injecting a, a bare particles without any targeting mechanisms into the mass. So <coughs> instead of accumulating in the tumors, <coughs> and they actually uh, find out most of the particle end up in the livers, because the molecule cannot get in touch on the uh, tumor cell surface. So you see, basically you see nothing of tumors, but you see a lot of signals from liver. 
So this becomes a very, um, very good technique. And also compared to fluorescent labeling, and, they, and you can do a pretty long-term observation. So you don't have any cold bleaching or quenching problems. The signal is very, very stable. So you can you, uh, you can do this monitoring for a living mouse for like a, a few hours or even a day to see to actually track how this molecules um, moving along inside the circulation system of the mouse model. All right, and the third application I want to talk about is a, a, a rather simple application, but a very important global application. This is work done uh, from Chinese group and published this year in Nature. Uh, surprisingly, this paper can be published in Nature, but I think their real world application is really, really interesting because this really starts to uh, collecting those orange samples from real farm. Okay. And then using their uh, um, surface coated gold particles and spread the particles on the surface of this orange and starts to detect uh, the Raman or surge signals of pesticide attached on the surface of orange. So they find the orange from two different farms. One farm that use a lot of pesticides. One farm we call it as an organic orange farm that they don't use a lot of pesticides. So they do a, they, uh, they do a comparison and they find out you have pretty strong signals for, uh, from a, a orange that is not organic and then you have basically very weak signals from organic orange. Here. So this is a peak they're looking at. This is a organophosphate. Um, it's a, a very common uh, pesticide. It's also a neurotoxin for uh, for the insect. But if the molecule, if the uh, the amount of this molecule start accumulating in our body, become a neurotoxin for the human body as well. Okay. So after talking about our work from many other groups, let me ta start talking about in thirty minutes talking about the work from my own group. Okay. And so what we are focusing on uh, nanoserous biosensing in my own group is that we're trying to uh, basically uh, mobilize some molecule probes on this nanoserous surface and then, uh, and then let this uh, uh, biomolecule probes to interact with uh, the real biological enzymes and then use a nanoserous detection to monitor this enzymatic reactions. Uh, so, uh, if for uh, doing this project, basically, we have to start by uh, building the, the model of these systems. And this is a picture, a very pretty picture uh, from our collaborators, Professor Klaus Schulten in Back Institute. And they started helping us do the uh, molecular uh, level simulations to see how these molecules uh, conform on this nanostructure surface. Okay. What you see in this picture is a lot of uh, peptides uh, that we use as a probe to detect particular enzymes. And when we mobilize this uh, peptides on nanostructure surface, and definitely this conformation of the peptide will become very different than its conformation in the free solution. So we started using a different ways to find that out. And so, if, for example, if we have this kind of peptides or DNA mobilized on the nanosurus substrate, then we can use it as a probe to detect uh, the actual biochemical reactions. And there's two mechanisms, two schemes are used in, 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 uh, in my lab for the detections. One, for example, uh, one is basically uh, if there is a uh, hydrolysis uh, uh, reaction involves, for example, uh, proteolysis or nuclease involves, then this, this peptides or DNAs can be digested, can be cut from some positions. Then if you have attack molecules originally attack, uh, attached to the surface, and after this uh, hydrolysis um, reactions, those molecules become the free molecules start flowing away. Then in the surface detections, you start to see a disappearance of this particular uh, peaks from these tech molecules. So this is one detection scheme to use in my lab. Another one is uh, the scheme that we use to detect the conformational change of the peptides. If there is an enzyme reacting to these peptides, it changes its uh, either chemical compositions 
uh, or the um, structures. And that allow us basically to, to, to see different molecules before and afters. For example, before the reactions, you have the 10 molecules farther away from the, from the surface. And after the reactions, for some mechanisms, these molecules have been brought closer to the surface because this mechanism is very sensitive to the distance between the molecule and the surface. You see how sensitive that is? That's 12 orders of magnitude, 12 powers. It's even more sensitive than FRED. FRED, we're talking about 60 orders. And here, it's a lot more sensitive. I don't have the uh, results showing here because we're doing one, one experiment that we start to synthesize peptides, start uh, to elongate the peptide one amino acid by one amino acid. So we start to detect and uh, start to see the signal difference between um, different uh, between the peptides in different land, but exactly the same signals. And we actually see that even with two amino acids, we can see three times the difference in terms of the signal intensity. That's very, very high sensitivity to confirmation change. And we're doing that, I'm not, I'm not showing that result here. And instead, I'm going to show you some interesting result. Um, one experiment we, we did is that we used this, the first scheme, the first method to detect the hydrolysis or protease um, reactions in, in the real biological samples. And here, in this, rea uh, in this experiment, we're getting some samples from prostate cancer patients from their um, urine or seminal fluids. And then we start to uh, incubate them um, with our uh, peptide conjugate nanocer substrate. Okay. So this particular molecule is we're looking at, which is uh, process specific energy. Uh, that is a biomarker molecule in a, um, in a sample is from prostate cancer patients. And this molecule is a serine protease. So uh, if you have a lot of this active molecule, PSA, present in this uh, sample, clinical sample from the patients, it will bind to the, uh, to the peptides, start to cut it from particular positions. If it cuts like this, then these peptides will become very different. And then all the signals coming from this half of the peptides will disappear because start to detach from the surface, floating away from the surface. And we know that and the molecule has to be very, very close to the surface, otherwise it loses soon. So by using this technique, we can see whether this PSA enzymes, this clinical sample is active, is biochemically active or not. So by using this technique, we can basically observe uh, the disappearance of the molecules at the further end of the peptides. And also we can do a dynamic or time-lapse measurements to, uh, to visualize this biochemical reactions and also to categorize the activities of particular enzymes. And, and, and then by using this technique, we can say how active this particular biomarker, uh, the cancer biomarker is uh, uh, in, the, in, in, in this patient. More, the, uh, more active the uh, biomarker is, the more serious the cancer progression is. And so uh, after talking about the application, the simple application of the first detection method, which is COM, the second one is more delicate that we want to uh, detect the conformational change of the peptides after phosphorylation. And so here, we're trying to, do, we're trying to synthesize the peptide on the surface <coughs> of the nanostructure, uh, nanostructure <coughs> by surface. And then uh, if we introduce a, a kinase molecules, a kinase is phosphorylation enzymes that react with these peptides. And then a particular residue, for example, tyrosine, will be phosphorylated and this uh, uh, hydrogen uh, atoms will be replaced by a phosphate group. So this is a very tiny chemical composition change in this uh, phosphorylation reactions. It's relatively hard to detect by forensics. As a matter of fact, there are very few commercial or Academic uh, fluorescence-based acid detect this phosphorylation detection because the, the, the change is very tiny. Um, but this is very important because if we look at what happens inside the living cells, and 
because I'm a firm large financial department, so I always view this from a circular, you know, from a circular point of view. If you look at the, the uh, integrated circuits in a living cell, you can see that there are thousands, tens of thousands of molecules interacting with each other. They form a really cascaded uh, web uh, that really intricated uh, those molecules interconnect with each other. There's not a simple one-to-one -one mapping relationship. Instead, it's a very, very um, complicated map. But if you look at those, start looking at those uh, links in this circuits, many of them, many of them actually is phosphorylation enzyme or kinase enzymes that phosphorylates its downstream enzyme can be phosphorylated by its upstream enzymes. So the signals actually deliver and start to relay from outside of the cells all the way into the nucleus and uh, by, to, by uh, adopting these mechanisms. The phosphate group started to relay from one enzyme to the other and to another. Eventually, all the way to the nucleus, start to, we started seeing some gene expression change. This is how the signals is transduct in a living cell. That's why um, this is so important that we have the ability to detect that phosphorylation reaction and, and, and to do it in a systematic way. Because by only detecting one particular enzyme doesn't tell us a lot of stories since we're having so many different enzymes involved in it. <coughs> so this is the map that from in vitro genes that um, so far people have discovered more than 800 kinase enzymes. And they put them together into a set called Kino. We, you know, you know, this is actually, this is the word adopted from genome and protein. We call Kinome, which is a whole set of kinase enzymes. So far, is, uh, people have discovered more than 800 enzymes, but this number is increasing every day. If you read biological publications, there is, uh, especially in biochemistry or molecular biology journals, uh, more than half of the publications is uh, related to discovering of new kinase enzymes or phosphatase in our okay. So, <clears throat> in our uh, goal, eventual goals, we're, we're, we, we want to uh, develop analysis tools allow us to detect the activities, not, on, uh, not only the whole, uh, not only a single enzyme, but also a whole map. If we have the way to detect the whole map, then we will be able to figure out this integrated circuit inside the cells very easily. So now let me introduce a nanosurf uh, protein profiling platform using my lab. We started building using engineering methods, nanofabrication methods, to start building those uh, proteomic profiling platforms to start to conjugate those and synthesize, conjugate different peptides on the surface and form a ray on the surface. And then start using scanning, uh, scanning laser citation to find out the signals from each spot. At each spot, of course, you will have one, one uh, peptide like this. The one peptide would uh, be designed to target one particular enzyme. And then we mount this uh, platform on um, this optical system, which is a scan, laser scanning line spectroscopy system. And then start to scan the laser. For the demonstration purposes, we actually build uh, Photo, uh, photographically patterned those nanostructures into a small square array. So what you can see here is on the surface you have a lot of the square arrays which is darker. And inside the square uh, you can find, if you, if you use SEM, scanning electron microscopy, uh, microscopy you can find the nanostructures. But outside it's basically smooth, very smooth surface. So if we scan a laser over it, you'll find whenever a laser get on top of these nanostructures, intensity has been increased for many, many times. That's why you can see those bright spots when the laser is shining on those dark, uh, dark squares. When the laser is shining on the smooth uh, metal surface, you don't see a lot because you don't have a very high electric field magnetic field uh, enhancement. So if we can do this, the scanning, um, and find out the raw mass scattering signal, or source gets, uh, source signals from each spot, Eventually, we can have a very big two-dimensional map allow us 
to construct into a finger, I call it anti-fingerprint, optical fingerprint map, and for us to, uh, to detect the activities of the enzymes in your sample. Um, so we start, so uh, in, in, before experiment, we started using simulations to predict how this molecule conformation change before and after reactions, or in how the molecule uh, conformation will be uh, under different biological conditions. And so this is a collaboration work for, from Professor Paul Schultz's group in the Vatican Institute, that we use molecular dynamic simulations to try to find out the structure of the molecule, not only in a solution, not only in the cell, but on the surface of nanostructures. So this is a movie showing you that this is actually what happens inside the cells, that you have many, many kinase enzymes starting from uh, transmembrane proteins and then to the downstream and uh, lower stream, and eventually all the way to the nucleus. So you can see that whenever it binds, you see this green light start to uh, light up. That means you have phosphorylation reaction. The phosphate group is transferred from upstream enzyme to the downstream. But this is how the signals transduct into the, uh, in the living cells. So in our simulation, basically, we have to be, uh, construct this molecule structures and also find out a charge distribution. And also by giving this molecule system a different buffer, different pH values, we can use molecular dynamics simulation to predict the actual conformations of the molecules. To show you this example, this, this work is still ongoing. Showing you as an example here, there's a three models, simple models that we um, we have three molecules, three peptides here. One, can you see that? Maybe not this one. Can you see this one? So we are actually attaching those molecules onto a surface. You are not seeing the surface here, but we actually have anchor points of these peptides on the surface to start to simulate a nanosecond scale, of course. Uh, uh, how these molecules reach to equilibrium conformations in uh, on the nanostructure surface. And this work is still ongoing. I hope I can show you more a few months later. So after, so this simulation can tell us a lot of things about conformation. But eventually, since we're, since our ultimate goal is to unravel the whole map of the kinase of the human, so we have to learn from system biologists use the system biology to study, uh, to actually help us design this array, this peptide probe array, to be able to uh, tell the information of this uh, kinase enzyme networks. So we started using some uh, softwares that allow us to, to uh, study the, the interaction between different peptides and different enzymes. Here what you see here, uh, the, the red, uh, spheres represent enzymes, and blue sphere, uh, uh, green spheres represent the peptides. So the peptide relationship with the enzyme is not a single one-to-one -one mapping relationship. It's also a very complicated uh, uh, network relationship. So in order to design the best array of peptide groups, we have to firstly find out their relationship, and then find the best combinations of the peptide groups and to tell us the information about those targeted red sphere or kinase enzymes. So I'm going to skip this part and then jump to a, a example, which is one corner, one part of this subfamily of this whole family is the kinase. For example, we can't just one tree with one branch of this tree, of these big trees. And this family is called SAR family kinase, including 11 kinase enzymes. Even for 11 kinase enzymes, you will see that it actually have, um, well, for tyrosine kinase, you have 133. The sour kinase are all tyrosine kinase, they have 11 of them. And the substrate of sour protein kinase is 137. As I said, it's not a one-to-one -one mapping relationship, so it's an intricate web. And then from this protein substrate, we can extract the moiety uh, sequence to build this peptide targets to a 258. And this can represent basically the whole set to targeting the SAR family kinase. And okay, talking about the chemistry and the biology, and then move to real electrical engineering, how do we build 
you know, we have molecule part, we need to have a solid state surface part to be able to, uh, to do that service. So while we do that using conventional nano manufacturing, we can do chemical, uh, chemical synthesis. Uh, of course, this has already become commercial available, you don't really have to do that in your lab. You can also use conventional nano fabrication technology, even photography or uh, folks are being photography uh, uh, to make different like, uh, dots or wires uh, to be able to uh, use them as a service substrate. But in my lab, we now are focusing on doing some unconventional manufacturing on a wafer levels and also which is compatible with current semiconductor foundry technologies. So we're not only able to make them in here, but also to make them in playroom in Santa Clara in detail. So this is a way that we are investigating that really can technology can really directly adapt into industry. Okay. So we so far we have figured out a way how to make a wafer level. We're thinking about four inch or six inch wafer mm -hmm. the whole surface covered with this whole high density of different geometries of uh, nano structures. So we, we of course uh, build this on a silicon wafers, try to uh, make this nano temple first and then deposit metal on the surface. <clears throat> and assume that we have made this surface, um, then we can actually uh, combine that with uh, optical lithography to make this micro dots, micro array patterns. On each dot, we can mobilize different path type probes. And then we start with laser scanning on the, on the surface, getting information of the network. And so this is an example showing that we use a sample, liquid sample spotting machines that spot different peptides on different spots over here. Okay. And then we um, uh, assemble them into a microfluidic platform, introduce a liquid into this uh, complete system, integrated systems. And then, of course, the sample we, we introduce is a raw uh, proteins from cell lysine at the very beginning. And then start the laser scan to detect the, the peptide signals before and after the active enzyme in this uh, protein right, in, in a cell lysis. So here's showing some examples. You probably uh, have five minutes to finish, but I'm going to finish really quickly here. This is, this is a close-up view that what happens when you drop the samples on the surface, on the surface. Okay. And this is what happens when you, when you drop it on our nano surface becomes pretty hydrophobic, standing over there become very small spots. But if you drop this liquid on a smooth silver or gold surface, it starts spread out. On a glass slide surface, it just spread like crazy. So if you want to spot this liquid samples into a very high density array, you have to have a surface that allow you to, you know, to make that liquid to be uh, uh, on a hydrophobic surface to really form a droplet not spreading out. So our samples not only provide very high surge effect, but also can allow us to do a very high density array spun. So you can see that it's a picture not very clear, but you can see we can spot very clear surface spots, peptides onto the surface. And also the molecule distribution is very uniform on uh, these nanostructures, but in the smooth surface, just like you drop your coffee on a table or a um, glass, you start when you try to start to see your wings. Well, this exactly happens in a proteomic field. You drop those peptides or proteins, bring peptide proteins on the last slide, eventually get this. But now we have the, the double benefit that we can get this pretty uniform pep protein uh, peptide distributions along the peptides at uh, the nanoscale surface. This is a real big thing for a whole proteomic field. Uh, so as you can see here, that we can spot many of them, and uh, it's very uh, <coughs> uniform spotting on uh, this substrate. Okay, um, so now it comes to the SIRS, the raw SIRS data, spectrum data. It's not very clear here, there's so many spectrum, it's hard to see. But as you can see that, um, you can see a pretty sharp piece. Those, are, those spectrum are actually from, uh, from those uh, nanostructures on our substrates, okay. from those spots. 
And so we find a better way to represent the state because it's not located. Apparently, we have 258 points, spots, and these spots give you a lot of uh, spectrum as well. So we find a way how to represent better. So we learn from genomic folks. So when we construct, we basically assemble our data into a way very similar that you see in a gene uh, heat map. When you, if you're if you're familiar with uh, gene expression uh, map, heat map, you will see something like this, which is color coded, a map that uh, represents that uh, tells you that which particular genes you have high expression, which particular gene you have low expression. So here we basically lay out our Raman spectrum in this uh, axis. Uh, in this x-axis, you see which uh, the wavelength or the wave shift, or uh, well, the uh, Raman shift or wave numbers, and which is the x-axis you see in this in this raw spectrum. But the y-axis we start to uh, uh, lay down different spectrum. Okay? So the y-axis is a number of the spectrum, and the color represents the intensity of each piece. So if we do that, you can see this block by block. For example. We have a peptide, the same peptide, on a on different point on the surface. It, it will give you statistically exactly the same spectrum. You lay them out, and this becomes exactly the same spot, the same block. So this block actually comes from a model called uh, volume six sheet. And the second block, and the second block, block is here. It's coming from a blank surface. So there's nothing. There's no peak. The third block here comes from a, a peptide with such a sequence, which all, with only one tyrosine residue in the middle. And the fourth one is very similar to the third one, but the only difference, this tyrosine residue is phosphorylated in the fourth peptide. So statistically, you can see they're very, very different. This is not only a comparison between two single spectra, but a comparison between many, many spectra. So this carries a lot of statistical significance, much better than before. Then we can be very confident saying, this is actually, we can use this platform to really tell a tiny biochemical difference between those peptides before and after the reaction with the kinase enzyme. Of course, we can also use those statistical uh, uh, clustering technique by using genomics to cluster those uh, data into different categories, and we can use a computer, use a bioinformatics tools to find out, um, you know, to actually cat, uh, categorize those spectra. This gives us a lot of automations that we actually just input, dump those tens of thousands of spectra into our program. Eventually it comes out and give us this. The program can tell us both all of this spectrum coming from the same species and they can be clustered together. And of course we have done some reliability and reliability tests and uh, the standard deviation is quite small. And we can also do comparative proteomic studies like we do in the, you know, genomics. Genomics, we have CGH, very famous techniques, comparative genomic studies. And in here, that we basically study how these peptides, uh, Rama signal change before and after the reaction with the enzymes. And then we can identify which particular wavelengths or wave shows has the highest uh, change. So this is what we call, now we're using this as genomic profiling heat map, that those red spots really tells you where the larger change occurs in this peptide sequence. And, and then I'm going to skip this part, of course, after doing this, I have to feedback into our informatics uh, systems, get information directly to biomolecules and cells. Eventually, we get to, down to the drug, the, the drug screening, drug discovery business, because you want to find some application that is the most lucrative place that you are looking for. And as acknowledgement, I want to thank many faculty here, especially Professor Bashir and Professor uh, Dr. Irfan Ma, and of course, Professor Jimmy Shah for inviting me here as well, and uh, Professor Cunningham, Professor Kim um, Shulton, and my students, collaborators, comments. <coughs>
two different ways of enhancing uh, water. Different ways of uh, enhancing this. Okay. Um, can you give us uh, some kind of a <coughs> ballpark number? Yeah. How much enhancement is achieved by which ways? Very good point. So, uh, of course, depending on how how uh, how well you design the system. And if you have a, as let's say, vast source substrate, and the theoretical limit of electromagnetic enhancement is uh, eight order orders of magnitude, eight orders of magnitude, ten to eight. And chemical enhancements uh, still under debate. Some some people are saying it's hundred times, people are saying a thousand times. So you have uh, two to four orders of magnitude range of. Them. So if you have get the best such uh, device in the world. Can get them to uh, 12 or But in most cases, um, you end up with like 8 or 9 or So we're doing a detection of the whole map, not only the single enzymes. So we will be able to tell that um, at which step the cell has to progress to. This uh, the sense that you're talking about, if you're talking about the stage of the cancer development, at different stage you will have different enzymes like this has been turned up, activity to be turned up. For example, in early stage there are not many kinase enzymes have the phosphorylation activities, maybe a few. But in the later stage, you start to see more and more kinase enzymes have very high uh, chemical activities. If, if, if that's the sense that we were talking about, then we can apply, by looking at the whole map, to see how many of them have been activated, chemically activated, or biochemically activated, it was, we, uh, we can basically tell what stage this cancer cells has been progressed. Well, if you're talking about sensitivity in terms of the concentration, now we're at, uh, at the uh, pico molar, which is chemical concentration, pico molar concentration range, or part per, part per trillion. Part per trillion. Like that. Yeah. How does that compare to other meats? Oh, it's, it's de definitely more sensitive than the rest. Yeah. That's, that's for sure. Well, in clinic, still the most sensitive thing is not this technique. It's a radioactive paper. That's the most sensitive thing. Right? And you can do long term, long -term you can do long term integration time for whole days. So you can actually get enough uh, radioactive emission. Uh, but here, we have, you know, each acquisition, each spectrum is only acquired within a second. So you can do this acquisition over and over again. Uh, if you actually adopt the system, Application. So what would you use? Why would you use this over the radioactive? Uh, because nobody uh, wants to use radioactive. They don't know this. You don't even see in this building, there's no way to use radioactive acid. In this campus, it's hard to find it. So people are trying to get rid of that. If we can find another way, alternative way, not using radioactive material. Talk about the cross thicker um, coating the growth level. Yeah. Um, what exactly did they use as a targeting agent for cancer? Uh, they, yeah, I think they just use an antibody for a epithelial uh, growth factor receptor on the cell on the cell membrane. So they just, uh, you know, I, I assume they just buy some commercial antibody and then conjugate on the surface of the particles. Those antibody can bind with the 
receptor on the cell in the end. Okay. Um, do you know if there's like an optimal size of the nano structures for uh, better signal? So, that's, that's very good question, but it's hard to answer. Um, yes, uh, there's no well, there's no simple answer for that question. So, because um, for, especially for a engineer nanosurface, nanostructural surface, uh, it involves a, a nanostructural wave uh, uh, geometry. So, uh, you can't, uh, in many cases, you cannot use analytical methods that you can, uh, that you can use for, for example, in this flat surface or spherical particles you can use analytical uh, equations to find out the enhancement. But for those uh, engineering surfaces, those non-conventional uh, surfaces like this, we have to rely on uh, the numerical simulations. So it's really hard to tell, before doing a simulation, it's hard to tell what surface is, is the best. So you actually have to start with some good guess from your experience, and then start to build uh, those now structures and, and then start to discover new mechanisms or uh, new new uh, things or, or or enhancement factors. This is actually how people start to progress in nano structure field, nano technology. Sometimes it's really hard to tell intuitively from their beginning when they started doing it, and they started doing modeling or the uh, uh, experiment to start to discover something and then you uh, just generalize that discovery input that into your design and help you design better device. Yeah. So for, you know, as a uh, uh, rule of thumb, basically you have to basically just to uh, include as many as possible sharp points, because that's, that's where the photo electron accumulates. If you can accumulate a lot of uh, free uh, of, uh, sharp points uh, within uh, unique areas, you can have a lot of hot spots and keep it a better enhancement. So we figure, like, Possible to get better signal if you increase the surface area. Well, the sur well only as only surface area doesn't give you a enhancement of signal. They only give you enhancement of the molecule. How many molecules that you can absorb on the surface? If you if you're talking about the same number of molecules, that didn't give you any advantage of 